Good morning. Thank you very much, Mary, for this uh, introduction. And I'd like to start by saying how grateful I am to the OECD team to have included my name in this team to review Ireland. <coughs> I am very happy to be back. I was not a student, but perhaps a postdoctoral uh, student here at DCU. I'm a physicist by background, so for me, it has been very pleasant to be back, and I have learned a lot from you guys. Now, I will address these questions about uh, uh, the organization capacity by the point of view of at system level and institutional level. I will talk a little bit about funding, both of uh, research and teaching, and I will try to speak about <coughs> the strengths that Ireland has in these two items and how those strengths can, if not looked after properly, turn into challenges. So the strengths. We all know that Ireland is the youngest country in Europe. Coming from one of the oldest one, I always feel happy here in Ireland, and I think you have the key for a great future. At the same time, you have managed to uh, educate your young generation. You have a remarkable attainment level of attainment in tertiary education, more than 50%, and you have a roadmap, you have a strategy for higher education. And that strategy is absolutely needed if you want to address properly the demand for qualified workforce, the need to approach research and industry, which you are already doing to a, a higher extent, I must say. But at the same time, you have to widen participation. The population in higher education should reflect the social, cultural uh, 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 composition of the population of the country. And at the same time, you have also to look at the mat mature learners. They need to be brought back into the system. And of course, this brings problems. And the first one is really the financial crisis. I, I, I thought that I would not mention this because this is sad, but, but I've got to. Because the cuts in higher education has been so drastic that you have not cut only the fat. You have almost reached the bone in certain uh, cases. <coughs> and, and, and this is dangerous. Then, because of your demographic situation, an increase on the higher education population is expected to occur. So come on, these cuts have to be stopped. Otherwise, how are you going to, to manage? But at the same time, you have to look at the primary and secondary education, and you need to look at the phenomenon of the needs of old age, because we are also living longer. And by living longer, we need more resources. And both higher education and all these, we compete for the public purse money. I don't know why, but it seems to be quite a tendency all over Europe that when cuts are done, they have a tendency of looking to higher education. I don't know why. Perhaps because we do not drive lorries across the roads and block the roads, or we don't do something like that. But I always feel, and I have a vested interest, I'm an academic at the end of the day, that this is it. We are a, the weaker partner. OK, strengths. We have, you have a number of top performing institutions. But in the good old days, you have put in some of those institutions a good uh, equipment. You have put infrastructure in place that have lasted 
until now. But now these things are becoming obsolete. They need to be funded. They need to be maintained. And when I speak about funding and maintaining, I'm not talking about physics or, 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 or uh, chemistry. I'm talking about all the sciences, everything from arts and humanities to engineering. Then, uh, so you have to look about, to look to it. And uh, there is no, how, how is research funded at, uh, at the university level? As I found out, and I hope I'm correct, the universities, the institutions are, are funded according, research is funded according to the number of research students, of researchers. And there are two incentives on top of that. One is the money per research that is brought into the institution via research contracts, and the number of degree awarded. Then I also found that you know, national priorities are addressed through competitive calls. That is normal. It's what happens in, uh, everywhere else in Europe. Uh, with the fact that you have quite a high number of, of uh, agencies uh, looking after this part of the business. Now, you have in terms also of research established some priorities. And in 2011 and 2012, there was an overwhelming importance given to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I do believe that to meet the challenges of this 21st century, this has got to be changed. We have to have equally STEM, but also arts and humanities. And they are absolutely essential to integrate knowledge. And being a physicist, I'm not a suspect. Then I also find, found that there is no systemic evaluation of research. I'm not saying that the research is not evaluated. Research is evaluated, but not in a systemic way. It's evaluated by some institutions that decide that they need evaluation. It's evaluated by the funders, because they will not give the money without evaluation. But these, these things do not uh, occur in a systemic and systematic way. Now, about governance and steering. I also found that the responsibility for higher education and research is shared between Department of Education and Skills, DES, and the Department for Jobs, Entrepreneurship, and University. Sorry about this pronunciation. And I found also that the main founder of research for higher education is DJ. And perhaps that for me is a little bit strange, because as in many other OECD countries, the research is done primarily at higher education institutes, institutions and the national institutes. And so it would make sense that uh, the, the, the research, whatever basic or applied, and here I quote a dear friend, we shouldn't say research, basic research and applied research. We should refer to excellent research. And, the res and we also have a research that is looking more towards industry, that is usually done in cooperation, close cooperation. So if we have to somehow split the two, let's split it this way. Now, let's look at the system approach on governance. How does the system in Ireland work? And what have been the changes introduced since 2011. And here, I must say, I was truly impressed by the amount 
of changes, transformation, effort put into the system. It's amazing. And I will talk a little bit later about the three components of that system approach. It's the dialogue, the compacts, and the regional clusters. Now, the strategic dialogue. So the HEA has initiated a dialogue with the, the higher education institutions, respecting their autonomy, but trying to negotiate with them a different approach or a more focused approach on the national priorities, on the three uh, uh, streams, education, offer of education, but also innovation, but also entrepreneurship. All this has been covered and respecting their autonomy, they talked with universities, they talked with IOTs. And the result, as, as a result of that dialogue, contracts were signed. And my first understanding of the regional clusters was that the regional clusters were a little bit more than this good uh, articulation between the, the offer and good pathways for students from further education and to PhDs. It was a, a little bit more. The clusters were meant to become, to transform Ireland into hub, a big hub of knowledge, as a big knowledge alliance, where you had education, we had education, but you also had innovation, you also had, had civil society, you would have eventually the quadruple Alex already referred today. And then I realized, well, perhaps what we are talking about is just the first phase of the clustering process. And so now I come to, after this fact finding, I come to the recommendations, which you are responsible for. I'm just so I'm in a very comfortable position. So I think it would be interesting to enhance coordination of the policy structures. I know that there are already a memorandum of understanding has been signed. So it's good that that memorandum of understanding becomes a, a, a tool, a reality. Uh, then if you have a high number of agencies funding research, you run the risk of uh, transforming the, the, the activities of universities and IOTs when applying for research into uh, paperwork, constant paperwork, constant applying, constant reporting, sometimes with different rules. And so it is difficult. It's making life difficult without really a reason for it. So perhaps you should look into this uh, number of, of, of uh, funding programs and see and agencies and see if you can somehow rationalize it. I know this is extremely difficult because some of them perhaps are there for historical reasons. And in the end of the day, we are talking about people. And people is the, is the most difficult thing in the end of the day to deal with. But here is the recommendation. Then I also would like to recommend to enhance the capacity of the regional clusters. After the regional clusters have come the regional skills fora. So I suggest that the two initiatives will not kill each other, but reinforce each other. <coughs> because if up to now you have been talking about regional clusters, and now we forget about regional clusters and move to skills fora, we might perhaps lose momentum. Also, again, perhaps because I had responsibilities in management of a university, a compact, a signed contract, is a very serious issue. You have agreed on performance, performance you have agreed on, on, on delivery, so it should be assessed. But don't do it every year. 
it's, it's a lot of work. It's perhaps to do it every two years and a half, every three years. Why two years and a half and three years? Because it seems, or it, it's, it is very common in Europe that these big programs last for five years, even funding agreements with big universities in Austria, for instance, they last for five years, and there is a mid-term evaluation, just to see if everything is okay, and if it's not okay, the path should be uh, 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 corrected. So, I recommend a cluster phase two, where now you have the education institutions in place. They have talked with one another, they have agreed to a certain uh, uh, sharing of the offer, sharing of resources. Now it's time to bring in, bring in the other stakeholders. It's time to bring in the enterprises the social uh, society. And also, this is something that it is mentioned in the country report, but I did not read any cluster plan. So it was supposed that these regional clusters would, would have plans. And apparently, they are still in the, the, the process of being developed. And here I follow perhaps the example of my own country. Although it's a small country, there are, the institutions are very diverse. And so if one would like to design cluster plans in a country with a diversity of institutions and, and diverse socioeconomic <coughs> realities, it would be good to promote a dialogue bottom-up. No. Uh, make the institutions responsible for their own strategic plans. Ask them, what do you want to do in five years? Where do you want to, to be? All of them. And if the government thinks that that is nonsense because it does not agree with priorities, well, you have the, the, the we in Portuguese say, we, you have the cheese and the knife. So you cut where you want. But you do not have a one-size-fits-all, but you have different clusters, different plans, that of course then you have to be articulated at the national level. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, these two are repeated. It's a national evaluation exercise that I recommend and broadening the scope for arts, humanities, and social sciences. Enhance interdisciplinarity in research, enhance sectorial mobility. What I mean by sectorial mobility is not, is not changing from mathematics into physics or chemistry or bio, biology. It's changing from high education into industry and vice versa. <coughs> or not even into industry, into government. Into government, why not? Exchange people. And then we learn from one another. Why? I am perhaps being too sensitive about what is coming in the future. You know that uh, the industrial revolutions in Europe have developed Europe, but with dire <coughs> consequences. The changes in the job market have been dramatic. And there is a fourth revolution brewing in our backs is the merging of technologies, is the connectivity of devices. And so universities and institutes of technology, higher education institutes, need to prepare their graduates to, lead, to, to, to deal with these changes. Because if you do not do it, nobody else will. So this is a, another responsibility that needs to be taken on board. Now to finish. I would like to thank the institutions that we have visited, in particular that I have visited, because I have learned a lot. So I need to thank you all for sharing your knowledge with us, with me in particular, and that's something that I cannot uh, uh, avoid saying, that universities and IOTs in Ireland are not ivory towers, but they have been towers of strength. 
I don't know how they have coped, but they did. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.